I certainly hadn't expected to be doing my first uh, talk to the Anchor Crews from the, the comfort of my own uh, study, but I'm very, very grateful indeed for the opportunity to be able to, to give this paper today, because this is a project that I've been involved with since 2011, and so it's become uh, effectively a part of my life. Now, Norwich Castle Keep is a familiar sight on the Norwich skyline. It's a symbol today of civic pride, but previously it was an equally dominant reminder of institutional power while it was used as the county jail for Norfolk and ultimately as a sign of a new political regime as the royal palace for an incoming Norman monarchy. And uh, in use as the home to Norfolk's County Museum collection since 1894, the keep is today the subject of a 13 and a half million pound project that will transform it and its surrounding museum buildings and make the museum fit for a 21st century audience. And in this lecture, I want to look at this Royal Palace Reborn project, looking at the many steps that have been involved and en route flagging up a number of the issues or considerations encountered in modern museology and how we maintain and adapt historic buildings for modern audiences. But first, let us look briefly at this building and I hope that people who are interested in uh, understanding the Norman history of the building won't be disappointed when I don't dwell on this in particular. It's the overall project that I really want to look at. Well, now a shell, the keep has been well recognized for its importance in Norman castle design. It was third in a line of English royal fortified palaces after the Tower of London and Colchester. And it's been described by Sandy Heslop as one of the most sophisticated architectural buildings of Northern Europe when it was built. And like most Norman castles, it seems to owe its origin to a wooden predecessor that was part of a modern bailey put up in the 1070s in the wake of the conquest. That such a structure was erected in Norwich is unsurprising. Quite beyond the wealth of East Anglia in the 11th century, Norwich was, of course, the boom town of the late Anglo-Saxon region. And this importance accounts for the diocese being moved here via Thetford from the original sedes in North Elmham and following an unsuccessful uh, attempt by the bishop to locate the cathedral at Bury St Edmunds. The keep itself appears to have been constructed from about the 1090s, started under William Rufus before being completed under Henry I. But there's still debate about this dating, although the traditional completion of about 1121, I think has much to commend it, not only stylistically, but making sense of Henry choosing to spend Christmas that year in Norwich. The castle itself comprised a series of baileys, and uh, in this particular shot, you can see just how close the, the castle keep on its mound is to the cathedral in the background. And the fact that they were very much uh, conceived of as a twin arrangement. Uh, the, the baileys themselves cover an enormous area of which about 5.7 acres were excavated during the recent castle mal excavations. And it really underlines just how massive an overall uh, structure the castle itself was. And the keep is on an enormous mound. It's a, a massive structure in its own right, 145 metres by 135 metres at its base and about 110 by 95 metres at the top. So it's one of the largest artificial mounds in the country, not least just for a castle. And it wasn't without its problems. And this seems to have caused partial subsidence because the original smaller mot was then added to and when the added uh, uh, stone keep was put on, the newer made up ground seems to have subsided slightly, causing cracking in the stone structure. Um, as Sandy Heslop has shown, the new structure was uh, an enormously um, extravagant exterior comprising complex blind arcading and using a proportion, a geometric proportion of one to three ratio of buttresses to plain walling. And the effect is both sumptuous and it's reflective of the keep being essentially a royal palace. It is also this ostentatious site and clean white stonework, which was the result of total refacing in the 1830s that greets today's museum visitor. And for us working at the castle, this is the basis of an ongoing dilemma 
in both the expectations and interests of visitors and the dynamics of the use of space within it. Because while the castle is an impressive structure from the exterior, internally its fortunes have been decidedly mixed. By the 14th century, Norwich Castle was used principally for the dispensation of justice and as the county jail, with the sessions conducted in the Shire House. And the poor conditions of the jail were highlighted by John Howard, and in response to these, a new prison was built by Sir John Soane in the 1780s. Um, undoubtedly, this was an advance, but the crucial element here was the stripping out of what was left of the Norman interior of the keep, with uh, virtually no records made of what the internal spaces originally looked like. In turn, Soane's jail quickly became outdated and a new prison was built by William Wilkins in the 1820s, sweeping away Soane's jail on the outside of the keep. This is Soane's jail block that we can see. It was originally uh, four stories high, but it actually caused substance, such was the weight of having the top layer. And so that actually had to be stripped out. And so we can see here on Wilkins' jail plan, the U-shaped sewn block still within the walls of the keep, but Wilkins adopting Bentham's panopticon idea of radiating galleries full of prison cells with the central block, it actually the governor's house, where he could look out on all of the various corners of the prison. Um, with, uh, with this particular prison, we see a separation of the prisoners into different areas, the idea being that um, those of lower crimes won't uh, infect those of worse crimes, but in turn, it became unfit for purpose. And so with that, a new prison was built on Mousehold Heath just outside the city in the 1880s, which is actually still in use. But the issue then was what to do with Wilkins building. Well, there were two main options that were discussed. Uh, the first of which was to pull down everything and leave a romantic ruin of a half pulled down Norman keep. And the second was to turn it into the city museum. And fortunately for us, the latter was chosen and a subscription was begun by uh, a local worthy, John Gurney. Now, Gurney had been uh, blinded in a riding accident. And this is why we have these unique sand plans that were developed for him by the architect chosen for the project uh, in which he could follow progress on the way that uh, proposals were being made to lay out the new museum. The person chosen for this was the local architect Edward Boardman and uh, he's reputedly uh, said well if it had held prisoners it will hold birds and this reflects the fact that the early Norwich Museum was uh, essentially founded as a natural history society with archeological interests and the art galleries only came later uh, in time for the redeveloped museum. Now, Ordnance transformation oversaw some eight feet of soil being removed from the keep, once again with no archeological record. He roofed the keep and he created an arcade to support this using a, a pseudo Norman style. And it was um, then fitted out with a balustraded balcony and a new main floor. And we have the exterior view of the modified prison cells here. And the keep was then uh, opened up on October the 23rd, 1894, by the Duke and Duchess of York. And as we can see from this view, not only the uh, pseudo-Norman arcading, but the balcony and the fact that the keep is crammed with ensuite mahogany desks and wall cases that allowed a wide range of ethnographic, archaeological and natural history collections to be displayed. Now, unsurprisingly, the keep has undergone numerous iterations since then, most recently in 2000, when the museum was closed for a total refit, most of which was directed towards repairing roofs, fitting new services and security, as well as providing a lift up the mound and another internal lift within the keep so that people could get up to the balcony level. Um, it also enabled a few new displays to be installed, but it's true to say that much remained exactly the same with entire galleries simply being reinstalled. There simply wasn't enough money to refit the whole museum. What this 
Heritage Lottery Fund project did do much of was to put the museum's infrastructure on a modern footing and as befitting any HLF project, it also demanded increasing awareness of user needs and of visitor evaluation. And this brought out many of the problems and tensions that we as staff have long been aware of. In particular, the keep is a problematic structure. Large and impressive as an interior space, it suffers uh, environmental fluctuations, which are bad for objects. And while the keep is our number one object and the prime motivation for many visitors to come and explore it, the inside is often seen as a disappointment. It's very hard to read. It is essentially a box with a roof on it. Equally difficult uh, is making coherent displays within the space. They disappear within the vastness. They lack walls to fix into because they're historic fabric. And even with a lift, it's very hard to get people to explore on the balcony. And an attempt at creating displays in the basement, which had originally been archaeology stores, led to it becoming something of a children's ghetto, where grateful parents left their offspring to explore. And uh, like latter-day uh, Flemings of the 1216 siege of the castle, they proceeded to often ransack the displays. So resort to computer reconstruction or models was often needed to try to recreate the internal spaces. And here we see uh, a previous version trying to show how the Great Hall would have looked and a rather less successful version, which uh, appears to have sort of laminate flooring. So consider some of the feedback that we had had. More of a museum than a castle. Uh, clues in the title of the museum, of course. Uh, a hodgepodge. A visit to a castle without getting to the battlements and looking out isn't a real castle visit. Good from the outside. Looks okay from the outside, but poor on the inside. It's a museum disguised as a castle. More clear was that many people actually missed the keep altogether because going in through our front entrance, they made their way into the central rotunda area where the prison governor's house had originally been and actually bypassed the keep altogether. So, it was clear that radical change and improvement was needed. Now, previous changes of displays were not clearly going to be enough. It was rather akin to moving deck chairs on the Titanic. The castle is a prime focus of people's interest, but the current layout simply doesn't enable people to engage with that. So in 2008 to 14, Norwich Castle Museum was part of an interreg 4A scheme called Norman Connections. And this enabled us to construct both experimental displays uh, and also focus on the Norman heritage of the building. And this is a, a connections partnership that was made, as you can see here, with Colchester, Rochester, Hastings, and in France with Bayeux, Falaise and Caen. And it gave us a, a great opportunity to not only network, but to look at alternative methods of trying to uh, explore Norman castles and actually to lay out displays within this. Now, it was um, when coming back from uh, a site visit over Castle, which had also recently undergone a development, that the then chief curator, Dr. John Davies, who if I can... Um, bring him there uh, uh, and I were, were driving back chewing over exactly what we could possibly do to uh, achieve this radical solution that we sort of looked at one another in a light bulb moment and realized that we needed to put the original uh, Norman floor level back in and this was one of the big problems with the keep that the current main floor level is actually halfway up the original basement and it's the balcony that stands at the original floor level. So where you would have once been able to walk, you would now be floating in midair. Now, as part of our Norman Connections project, we also had a conference on Norman Castle, which is now published. And you, if you rush out to Oxbo, you will find that this has now remained, sadly, but it's well worth a read. And on the third day of this uh, conference that we held as part of our Norman Connections project, we held private seminar of those from the participating venues. And we went through the various means that we were using to try and go through our, um, our redisplays and interpretation. And it was there that Stephen Brindle, who had been 
involved in the Dover Castle reconstruction said, really, if you want to explain this place, you, you need to put a floor back in. And more than just putting in a floor, we needed to try to recreate those actual room spaces. Well, this was, uh, if you like, a vindication for John and myself to push on with this. And in the meantime, while we were trying to push the agenda for that, we managed to put up some very modest uh, temporary ex exhibition displays, including this particular part where we were trying to show how the chapel area, which was on the balcony, would once have been walled off and might once have looked when it was dressed. We were lucky at this point that we uh, found that actually this was nothing new. If you have a good idea, you can bet your bottom dollar someone else has thought of it. And of course, this was something that had been done at Falaise, which acted as uh, an inspiration, although unlike the version at Falaise with its glass floor and the fear of upskirting Frenchmen, we decided that we would need uh, a solid floor. We were very influenced too by the Dover Castle experience where uh, a whole series of reconstructed room displays were actually able to show uh, an immersive display towards guiding people for this uh, idea of the ostentation of a royal palace. And this was something that we felt we clearly needed. One of the interesting things that we did find about this uh, idea of ours was that this was nothing new. This was something actually that Edward Boardman had wanted to do himself. And in his original plans, he had shown uh, the floor, a main floor being put in at the principal floor level of the Norman Palace. And this was unfortunately something that the museum's committee had overruled for expense. Now, not to be uh, put off by this, he subsequently went back to the museum's committee with a half a floor option, which is the version you can actually see in front of you, uh, whereby he had the eastern half divided off to show the Great Hall and then uh, the balcony level extending from that. Unfortunately, the museum committee once again told him that it was too expensive, he couldn't do it, and he ended up having to go for uh, just a balcony at this level. Subsequently, there were attempts again in the 1970s and in the 1980s, uh, mooting the idea of putting the floor back into the keep, but these were again rejected because there simply wasn't any money. We were then at this point lucky to be able to secure a government grant uh, shortly before Cameron went to the country uh, to develop this and administered through Historic England, it enabled us to be able to put together architect's plans and to actually start looking at the practicalities of being able to do this. And we held extensive consultations with Historic England and Norwich City Council who actually owned the building to start with to look at whether this was physically possible. Now, beyond simply being a nice curatorial idea that we felt had real legs, there are many other factors in modern museums that uh, made this an exceptionally uh, useful idea to be able to run with. In the first place, everybody will be aware that museums are under increasing funding pressure. It's uh, absolutely axiomatic that we have to be able to produce more revenue to be able to maintain not only the museums but the services that run those and in short it was in turn going to protect Norwich Castle's future as a building. It would enable us to have uh, optimum viability of the site, the site would be very well used and in turn by that it meant that we were able to bluntly justify our existence, it would mean a more resilient and sustainable museum service. We wanted to be able to produce uh, an upswing in not only visitor figures, but visitor satisfaction levels. It was very clear from the evaluation that we were doing that we weren't able to do enough, certainly within the keep, to be able to satisfy the people that were paying to come in. It's also clear that there is this heritage at risk issue with the keep. It's a 900 year old building needing constant maintenance, and we wanted to be able to prevent irreversible damage to the keep. We have to meet increasing financial pressures and when we started out on this uh, this journey uh, there was nothing like the uh, problem that we're now facing with Covid 
but we were also bound to secure time-bound match funding. In other words, there were a number of grant sources that were then available that we simply had to be able to get hold of to be able to uh, make the project work, which we had to grab while we could. So we need to be able to do all that we can as a museum and as a service to drive forward. And this is so. Uh, th this is the reason that we had to do it now. And we therefore had uh, the, the vision that we wanted to be able to put to the National Lottery Heritage Fund. And they came back with a few wants of their own, in particular, a need to link together all of the existing heritage assets in Norwich. They felt that they had put a lot of money into various historic assets in Norwich, but they wanted to see a more joined up approach. And they were hoping that uh, the castle with its interpretation of the medieval city would be a perfect way of helping to uh, navigate that. We wanted to restore the historical and architectural integrity of Norwich Castle Keep so that people would be able through this reconfiguration of the internal layout to actually finally understand the buildings and create our, our own immersive learning experience. We're nothing short if not ambitious. Uh, we want to make the castle a premier heritage destination in the east of England. We already attract over 200,000 visitors and our projection for visitor figures after this project is that it will go up to 300,000. We wanted to create this state of the art venue for people. It would enable us by having a, a great hall to have another public space able to be used for formal and informal learning events, as well as uh, commercial functions, which are, of course, uh, a major component of uh, income streams to any museum these days. We're also very, very lucky. We have had an ongoing relationship with the British Museum for a number of decades in Norfolk Museum Service, and it gave us the opportunity to create uh, a partnership gallery of the medieval period with the British Museum. And this would enable us not only to highlight our own fantastic collection of archaeology, but also through the British Museum's international collection to help to illustrate how Norwich and Norfolk more widely was uh, uh, exceptionally important on an international stage. Equally important, particularly with an historic building, is to eliminate barriers to access and to create a significantly better visitor experience for people. And finally, we wanted to establish Norfolk Museum Service as a national lead for early years, which is something that our learning team have been building on for a number of years. And this is one of these ways of uh, opening up public access. This is a changing space. And this was something that from the very outset, we were very keen to be able to do. There are a number of people who simply can't go out visiting sites because they have needs of changing places to be able to, to wash down if necessary. And it enables not only a diverse audience, but basically any audience to be able to come into the museum and look around. In addition to um, these other things, we obviously wanted a number of learning outcomes to be uh, put into place. And this came from our display and interpretation concept document that stated these key learning outcomes. And these uh, ran through that simple take home messages. Norwich Castle was a royal palace. And when it was built, it was one of the most prestigious buildings in contemporary Europe. The Norman conquest wrought changes across English society and it enabled the rebuilding of Norwich with this twin secular and religious power structure of castle and cathedral. Norfolk agricultural wealth also made Norwich England second city for much of the medieval period, indeed one might say right through from the late Anglo-Saxon period. Norwich was a city of European importance with extensive international contacts. We're one of the first places you bump into when you sail west from the continent. And to this we could probably add that the medieval world was a period of dynamic change. It wasn't this fixed thing that we can tend to look back on. Uh, 12th century England was very, very different by the 16th century. And in line with our aspirations to be uh, one of the go-to places for a heritage attraction in Eastern England, that our gallery should not simply reflect Norwich, not only indeed Norfolk, but East Anglia more generally. Well, we needed to make a start and this really involved us looking at the asset that we had. 
we had already seen that the prison had been swept away by Boardman within the keep, and Boardman's creation itself was a significant intervention with its own historical significance. So while the theory of putting a floor back in has much to commend it, we have to be equally mindful of the keep's past iterations. And so with that in mind, we commissioned an assessment of the Boardman architecture of the museum to see what we actually had and to judge its significance. And the conclusion to that was that this was a grade one listed building due to the Norman architecture. Even as a ruin without the Boardman architecture, it would be a grade one listed building. But uh, without the Norman architecture, the Boardman architecture in alone would not be so judged against the key. It was certainly something of merit, but it wasn't something of outstanding significance, but of local importance. Now, the Boardman's original architectural vision within the keep was now only partial. It was also due to, uh, to ongoing changes over the years. And so Boardman's hand, we appreciate, was actually better preserved elsewhere within the museum complex, in particular places where all of his original mahogany uh, display cases, for instance, alongside the terrazzo floors still existed. Throughout the subsequent development of ideas, we sought advice and had a very close dialogue with our Historic England inspectors, David Eve and Will Fletcher, and I'd like to um, pay my uh, appreciations to them for all of their hard work in what was a, a very full schedule they already had to be able to go, go through what might be possible and why, what might not be. And we also attempted to engage from an early date with the amenity societies and with local groups. Now, as ever, the planning submission that we had to put in had to take account of the perceived benefit of the changes proposed against the loss of historic fabric. And it's instructive, I think, that despite the widespread publicity of the scheme, we had only two objections lodged during the planning process, one of which was quite understandably uh, and unsurprisingly from the Victorian society. So what are our plans? Well, ultimately, they're based on the visitor's needs or experience while retaining a need to be true to the curatorial origins of the project. And so this is uh, a sort of cartoon version, if you like, of how we envisage the internal structure uh, looking when the changes have been made. And these are some of the more detailed plans. I'm very aware that in the short time that I have available, I can't go into enormous detail about this, but this is the ground floor. And within this, we will not be making uh, fundamental changes other than to point out the lift and the staircase here that will rise all the way up through the building. And the space here, which had been shut off to the public, will now be fully available uh, and this will be an early years gallery and we're going to have a, a, a sort of orientation and computer area here where we intend to have um, not only AVs but augmented reality in our uh, V archaeology, a virtual uh, reality archaeology in which we'll be able to look at some of the spaces that are actually being physically excavated through uh, the help of VR. The current main floor of the Victorian building is going to be preserved at floor level in the southern part here. And so while we'll have a new floor itself put in, this will be the area in which we have the British Museum Partnership Gallery. And you can see here an early iteration of the way that the display cases are laid out. And again, the floor level that the Victorians inserted here uh, alongside new doorways uh, here and here that uh, Borden put in will be preserved. And the main difference will be that we will remove the floor area in the center of the northern half. And that will give people not only the opportunity to look from a balcony level here down into the basement, it will more importantly enable people to see that basement floor level and look up above their heads to the original uh, height of the floor of the main uh, the, the main principal floor that, that the Norman rooms sat on. In other words, it's a huge basement area that the Normans constructed, and this will be the first chance people will actually have to be able to uh, re-appreciate the size of those spaces. And it's obviously on the 
principal flaw where things begin to get interesting. And this is where we have the current arcade that uh, you can see that runs along here that replaced uh, an original solid spine wall in which the Great Hall can be reconstructed along with the mezzanine that originally extended uh, at a slightly higher level to its west and to the south, the King's Chamber, which we can see uh, the size of in the uh, southern wall uh, along here and the chapel area. And one of the, uh, if you like, uh, clever things about the way that the architectural design has been done is that those modern interventions that need to be made in, in particular the southwest corner where the staircase and the lift shaft again are, are where we're less certain of the internal layout. And again, to the north of the chapel, again, where we're not clear about the layout, we're not trying to reconstruct it. We're actually showing a modern area with a staircase that extends up onto the roof. And in this particular area, just outside the keep, we are now going to remove a very low claustrophobic roof and have a double height atrium roof of glass. And that's particularly important because uh, you remember a, a little while ago, I mentioned how some people go straight in and they miss the keep. And that's because they can often find it hard to see the east wall of the keep as they go down that passageway with a double height atrium we're now going to be exposing the eastern wall of the keep so that it's visible to everyone to help orientate themselves within the building and to the north where the cafe area currently is we're going to create a two-story toilet block again thinking of our visitors Finally, this is the mezzanine level from the Great Hall. And this is something that will uh, not only be reconstructed in the space where it once uh, occupied, but it will enable us to have a large space for learning teams. And we have the obligatory plant rooms tucked away where they would have been above the chapel and the roof space. And I think for me, even though I'm excited about the curatorial opportunities here, I think one of the the greatest achievements of this project and the, one of the things that gives me greatest pleasure is to see that the roof will now be a roof platform enabling full public access so if you're in a wheelchair this is I speculate the only castle where you will be able to go up onto the battlements in Britain I think it's going to be one of the the best things that people are able to take home with them and that is provided by uh, an extra fire rated lift being put in that goes all the way through up to that roof platform. To give you some sort of visualization, this is the, uh, the atrium space on the left-hand side that will enable you to see right up to view the, the east face. And most interesting, I think, is to, again, and to enable uh, disabled access, a new bridge that will go and go through the east wall where again we think there may originally have been uh, an entrance way and I suspect that although it is primarily a fire escape route for um, disabled people within the building it will actually turn out to be one of the features of the building where people will want to go on the bridge to look down. These are the sorts of graphics that uh, you have to put together to try and visualise the space when you're putting together a, a lottery bid. But it is uh, still quite relevant today uh, in terms of uh, how we're envisaging the reconstruction to, to try and be aiming so that we can try and give that idea of how the keep might have looked uh, when it was lived in with the uh, mezzanine level that you can see above it and the way that the Great Hall could have been either used for feasting or for the dispensation of justice. And the fact that particularly unusually, it has a kitchen within the castle building uh, just to the west of the Great Hall. And one of the things again that the lottery was very keen on for this immersive experience was having the sort of orientation AV show that helps to really draw the visitor in and help them to try and imagine the space and how it might have looked. This is a, a visualization of how the uh, roof platform will look. One of the nice things about this is that at the moment we have to have guided tours only to the battlements. Now it will be free access and that will enable people to come and go as and when they want. And within 
the basement, this is showing the basement area to the north. We have the original pier bases that supported the vaulting holding up the Great Hall floor. And this is the balcony here for the British Museum Gallery. We are commissioning uh, a light artist to be able to reconstruct in lights the way that that arcading would originally have run across that space to support the main floor. We also uh, place a great deal of emphasis uh, on our early years experience. We um, have been working on this. Schools, are, uh, schools and families are one of our core audiences, something we want to do develop further and so this is a space that we are calling those who play and of course one of the principal things that you have to do when thinking about a, a large project like this is the archaeology and the historic structure. We know that there had been a number of excavations in the Keep basement uh, over the years but uh, one of the paradoxes was that in doing small scale excavations to preserve the archaeological resource, it actually meant that it was very hard to contextualise what had been going on archaeologically. We also knew that there were going to be various interventions needed. So, for instance, we were going to need a, a stairwell to be put in here to go up to the um, balcony level. And in this particular area, we were going to need uh, the new lift pit and the uh, platform base for the staircase that we're going to go through the whole structure. And so in consultation with Will Fletcher from Historic England, we devised this area of wider excavations to re-excavate the existing uh, trial holes that have been dug to better contextualize them, as well as to carry out a lot of the archeology span that would need doing in advance. So it wouldn't uh, hopefully delay the building program. We were also very keen that sort of um, survey of the walls that we had got only uh, as photographs should be redone as a full scale metric survey. And we commissioned Downland to do a one to 20 metric survey of the entire interior space of, of the uh, interior spaces of the uh, elevations. And these mean that we now have a stone by stone drawing of all four internal walls. And this metric survey has actually been uh, of enormous help to us, not simply from the sort of planning and recording, but actually for the architects, because it's formed the basis of the Revit model, which has been subsequently used uh, for all of the architectural and structural engineering designs. It's absolutely essential in a project like this to be able to have the ears of uh, people that you know and trust know what they're talking about. And we've been exceptionally lucky to attract uh, a, a fantastic academic advisory board. And they have all to a person been extremely great, uh, generous and uh, good with their time in pr producing uh, feedback for us to help us be guided in what we should and probably shouldn't be doing and uh, to be able to help develop the ideas that we have put into place. And a perfect example of this is, okay, it's fine to say that you're going to have internal wall spaces done, but what might it actually have looked like when you get down to the, the granular detail? How will you actually have the walls? Where will you actually put them in? And these are the results of a discussion that has been going on even within the last few months, which we're now submitting a variation as part of the planning uh, con uh, conditions to, because we want to make modified changes as a result of further discussion and further problems that have arisen. In particular, the fact that the doorway into the chapel uh, from the King's Chamber runs along here. And we wanted to know things like, which, which direction do you think the door would have opened? In this particular case here, we know that we have an angled archway that would have extended originally but the angle of that archway would probably have been far flatter because the wall would have been open for a partial wall walk. We're simply not able to do that. And so the compromise that we're striking is trying to demonstrate the way that this wall walk would have been in position um, and yet have um, a, a, an archway that is open with enough space for free access for visitors and yet is slightly detached from the original fabric. So we won't be building onto the original fabric here, but onto the 19th century brickwork, showing the way that there would have been an arch while actually preserving the original um, jointing of the artwork there and, and the springer of that. And likewise, we've decided to thicken the walls so that you're 
still able to read the Boardman architecture, but at the same time have the, the thickness that would have been associated with the original Norman walls. So it's been an incredibly uh, time consuming, but very fascinating process trying to actually then map out what the internal structure would have looked like. In particular, then trying to map out how the well would have acted because it would originally have gone all the way up to the mezzanine level. It's important in something like uh, this project with its aspiration for having uh, a truly immersive feel to be able to get all of the fixtures and fittings within those reconstructed rooms looking as authentic as possible and also giving opportunities for the community to be involved. And I think this has been one of the really exciting projects that has uh, kicked off as a result of that. One of the things that we were impressed with at Dover was the way that the uh, textiles were very um, ostentatious uh, and that they were a very visible reminder of the sort of temporary fixtures that a king might take with him while he was moving from palace to palace. And I, in a loose moment, said, wouldn't it be nice to have a sort of Bayer type tapestry or uh, before uh, I'm reminded that it was actually an embroidery, something like a, a long embroidery strung out there. And uh, we came up with the idea of something of East Anglian relevance. So rather than simply copying the Bayer tapestry, we now have our own tapestry that is going to feature the revolt of the three earls in 1075 and the revolt of Herald the Wake, the conceit of which is both showing the divine right of William to rule by his suppression of those revolts. And this was the original cartoon that was put together by Fiona Gowan. And this is her subsequent line drawing which as you can see from the below panel, which is one and a half meters long, has subsequently been uh, completed by one of a number of volunteers that we have. We've attracted a group of ladies, and it is sadly only ladies so far, that have formed a tapestry group that have mastered the Bayer stitch and have been working on this. And the tapestry itself that they're now working on is going to be 18 meters long and will hang in the king's chamber. But all of their samplers that they use to get to learn the stitch aren't being wasted. And as you can see, subsequently, these have been put together to form a banner. These are the sorts of um, PK work uh, banners that we're now working on. And these again will go into the Great Hall to hopefully be able to brighten up that space. I want to end by looking at what we can do museologically and by making the most of a new build. We're very, very lucky, as I said, that we've got a partnership with the British Museum that has been in place for decades now. And it was John Orner Ornstein that said to us, well, have you thought about having a partnership gallery here, which we hadn't? And through the generosity of the British Museum, we're going to be able to take on long term loan about 60 items to meet the thousand odd objects from our own collections that will be put on display here. But more important, I think, is making the most of a new build. For instance, how often have we seen floor tiles on display in a museum, always mounted in a display case? Because we're putting in a new floor, we're actually going to be able to put in a new display case actually in the floor. And that's going to show floor tiles actually in the context that they would have originally been seen. And in this particular example, it's going to be surrounding a grave because we actually have a medieval burial complete with its coffin, which we're going to put in situ surrounded by the sort of floor tiles that would have uh, covered a grave like that in the medieval period. It's also an issue about how you choose to interpret the medieval period. We know it's a period of profound change, but how do we present it to a public? And this is where our uh, idea of those who play comes in, because it will provide a counterpoint to one particular presentation of medieval society as those who fight, those who pray and those who work. The alternative being something like this, a chronological review of the medieval period that takes you from the Norman conquest to Reformation England and helps to perhaps signpost those things that people might have heard of, like the Black Death or Crusades, Wars of the Roses, but don't actually know how to fit that in chronologically. Well, the idea that we've gone for is the vision of society because it's enabled us to present stories in a, a far more coherent way. And that's in particular uh, caused by the fact that it's very difficult to, call, uh, to, to create displays that are 
equally sizable and um, reflective of all of the issues from 12th century compared to the 15th century when there's far, far more material. And that's, that's not simply a reflection of Norwich Castle's collections, it's a, a national picture. And even the British Museum will tell you that there isn't an enormous amount of 12th century material that they could uh, draw on to show all the sorts of stories that they might want to. It also gives us the opportunity to draw up particular local references, like, for instance, the, the Fastolf sword. Uh, there's no actual relationship to Sir John Fastolf with this sword, but it's the name that has begun applied to this particular sword, with Easter Castle, which Fastolf built, and which might well have been a copy of Palais, which again relates the um, the medieval archaeology of Norfolk with the international contacts that we enjoyed. We also want to make it as interactive as possible. And here we see something from the Agincourt Visitor Center being uh, proudly modeled by two of my children, as well as looking in more detail at things like the church. This is actually a prayer roll that's in private ownership, but which we're uh, hoping to take on, on loan that uh, was issued from Bromholm Priory, which was a site of national pilgrimage, which again, we have other material which we'd like to use to be able to explore the idea of things like pilgrimage. Jewish Norwich is another very interesting feature of medieval Norwich. There was a large and thriving Jewish population until, of course, the expulsion. And yet it's very difficult to tell some of these stories. There's the famous public record office role that shows uh, Moke the Jew and uh, is caricatured uh, as we can see in this, this bottom corner here. We also have the story of um, the blood libel which originated with the martyrdom of William of Norwich, almost certainly a, a creation by the Cathedral Priory to try and invent for itself a, a relic and some pilgrimage. So we've engaged the services of the modern day synagogues within Norwich, and they are not only choosing the subject lines that we will use to explore Jewish Norwich, but they're actually going to be writing the panel themselves and choosing the poetry of Mayor of Norwich, who was uh, uh, one of the only medieval Jewish poets from England whose work still survives. There are many other stories to tell, like the production of pottery. Why is it that we have a place in Norfolk called Potterheim? Well, quite clearly, there's a thriving industry in the production of things like pottery that has resonance to our local visitors, as well as an interest to all visitors, I hope, along with other production. So we have, in particular, wonderful objects like this uh, mould from the Massacre of the Innocents, and we have this mould of a pilgrim badge, the actual badge produced from which uh, was found in the Thames and which is now in the Museum of London. And we need to be able to draw out other stories, for instance, showing that uh, life in the medieval period wasn't all misery, but that there were lighter moments of people gaming, playing music and uh, enjoying romance. There are local stories like the Norwich Dragons, uh, we have examples from Dragon Hall, a 15th century merchant's hall in Norwich, that really illustrate how important the dragon was to civic pride within Norwich, because it was the Guild of St George that was effectively the organisation that one had to belong to to become a mayor of Norwich. It was part of the political establishment of medieval Norwich, and we have a number of objects found within the county that seem to highlight this popularity of George that might have been acutely felt in Norfolk. We want to be able to draw out the story of trade and travellers, whether it be through imported French pottery or a gold Baltic type cross, or even uh, this 12th century Byzantine bulla that was found near Thetford. And in thinking about the sorts of ways that we use our displays, money, mints and the cost of living is an extremely easy way in to be able to teach children not only the value of money, but also numeracy skills that fits in with the sorts of programmes that our learning team deliver. We want to be able to talk about women and gender within this. And so rather than focusing simply on knights and castles, reflect the fact that castles had aristocratic women in them and they were equally important in medieval society for their own reasons. We want to be able to tell that chronological story through style. We have um, a partnership with the art school 
and it'd be very interesting to try and develop the way that uh, we actually show art styles within an archaeological gallery itself, running from these fantastic Romanesque objects all the way through to the Gothic. And also the, uh, the ever-present fact that food and health was not great in the medieval period, trying to challenge myths like they were smaller than us, as well as point out the fact that, according to some estimates, half of the 14th century population was aged 21 or less, and the average life expectancy was exceptionally poor. Despite that um, rather poor picture of the medieval world, we also want to reflect on the advance of science and the way that Norwich Cathedral had, for instance, a clock in the 13th century, and that the development of astrolabes uh, taking on Islamic uh, technology was able to develop in the medieval period. And so this was a period of uh, growth in knowledge. And using uh, a burial that was attributed to Lady Eleanor Talbot, we want to be able to show the advance of science in being able to help us to understand the medieval past, how we know what we know, or how we think we know what we know. And this is a particularly good example, a facial reconstruction of this skeleton that was excavated from the White Fries in the 1950s, has since had DNA uh, examination. And while even modern examination of the skeleton seemed to suggest it was a female, it now looks as though it might actually have been a male. And this is something that uh, is showing how these exciting uh, new techniques help us to rewrite past. So in conclusion, I'm very aware that I've had to rattle through an enormous amount of material. We're at the moment working on uh, a very large scale redevelopment to a very sharp timetable. There's an awful lot of work that still needs doing, and this gives you just some idea of that. Uh, not due to COVID, but due to our timetable, we closed the keep and the front entrance to install the building area. Uh, but not the museum. And this is one of the big messages that we are desperate, obviously, to get out. People know about the work in the keep and the fact that that is closed, but the museum still remains open, albeit, of course, not uh, at the moment with the latest lockdown. And then we aim to reopen on a, a, a staggered reopening with the front entrance, the cafe area and the new reception in November 2021. And then a month later with new toilets, and then finally, July 2022, we reopen the keep. And uh, that being the case in August, I fully plan to go on holiday. So I'll leave you with this image showing the tower crane that is now on the mound. We're having to use this because uh, the funny thing is they built a castle without really wanting anyone to be able to get into it very easily. And that in turn means that we're not able to use the current bridge because it has a seven ton weight load on it and we're going to have to pull everything up that we want including all the steel work onto the mound using this tower crane and then lower it into position. The building work has started, yes we've already hit a few snags like asbestos as you might expect but at the same time we're now working on a, a fascinating project and I hope that in 2022 I might be able to come back and provide an update and even some feedback on the final result of that. I leave you, therefore, with the obligatory acknowledgement to all of our funders. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very, very much indeed for that, um, Tim. As a, uh, it, it's it's wonderful to hear such a depth and breadth of understanding and vision um, in relation to a what should we call it an institution a facility a resource that's got so much um, value um, and one would even say even more potential uh, not just potential for the future but potential for a very very wide range of um, users. Um, who can get um, involved with it. I'm very, very impressed indeed with and excited to see the, um, uh, the production of that tapestry and just the, you know, the, the involvement um, that's in, uh, in, engaged in um, all of that. <coughs> um, I am waiting to see if any um, questions are uh, coming through. Um, 
and I don't know if I'm looking at the wrong bit uh, for this uh, yet. Ah, yes. Um, so uh, I'm just trying to pick one um, up here. Um, the first question that has come through is from um, Heather, um, who says that she loves the, the light interpretation in the uh, BM uh, gallery. Um, it's a very technical question. How is it done? Um, is it done by projection or is it done by clever LED uh, lighting? It's a that's a very interesting question because I, I'm not absolutely sure yet. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> the reason for that is that um, this was something that was originally in the architect's design portion, but they very quickly realised that this was such a specialised piece that really we needed. Um, somebody more familiar with working with lights, a sort of light sculpture person. And mm. so the idea is that it will probably be LEDs. And the reason for that is that it will then be able to be lit up to illuminate the shape that we want, rather than actually causing any problems with light bleed, in particular into the British Museum Gallery, where we are having to mm. control mm. the lighting far more carefully. So. I'm, I'm interested to see how it is finally tackled, because one of the, the potential issues that we have, which we need to, to resolve, is whether there'll be any bounce from the Great Hall floor above and the way that we dampen that so that we don't have this wonderful uh, solid looking light wall bouncing around, mm. uh, particularly when people are, are wandering around in the summer in great numbers. But that, that, that's the idea. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> right, now, now, here's another sensory um, experience that you um, hadn't uh, uh, mentioned, at least in your in, in, in your talk. Um, uh, can I encourage you, the um, questioner says, to cook real medieval food for all those who visit the castle? Um, it could be offered free and or sold in the cafe. I think this would enhance the experience of all those who visit. Have you thought about this at all? Yes, yes, we have. I originally wanted uh, a new hearth to be put into the Great Hall because one of the things that really struck me about Dover and which I think is is one of those things that is intangible until you're in the space is the smell, that wonderful wood smoke smell because they still have the fireplace that's surviving in Dover and you walk into things like the King's Chamber and you just smell that wood smoke. Uh, unfortunately, I was overruled by health and safety because of the fire risk of having a new fire put into the keep. So it is something that we do want to do through, uh, we'll, we'll have a, a replica fireplace and we will, I hope not have too chemically wood smoke smells uh, being pumped out through that. We already actually do uh, elements of uh, medieval cooking and eating through our learning program. So I don't know about giving away food for free. That, that, that sounds something that I would probably be voted down on. But it is something that we are already doing and it is something that we would like to expand on. And the whole idea of having smell as one of those sensory elements will not just be limited to things like wood smoke in the Great Hall, but there's obviously a fireplace in the King's Chamber. So we want to be able to produce the same there. We want to be able to have the smell of incense in the chapel area. And best of all, of course, you can't do without um, smelly smells and farting noises in the garderobes. So that's something, again, that we're hoping to have. Certainly is an all-in experience um, in, <laughs> in, 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 in that way. Um, I was interested, Tim, to ask you about the um, challenges of representing the city of Norwich as well as the castle, rather than just, as it were, the castle. I, that might not, might not be very well um, presented, but, you know, just as you will be dealing with um, a range of different visitors from the, 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 the local school groups, local regular visitors to the tourists who want to come in and have their own um, experience of there. And that will no doubt vary at different times um, of the year um, as well. You know, you, you, you do have these um, spheres of local relevance around you. As you said, you've got the, you've got the town, you've got or the city, uh, you've got the county, you've got the region of East Anglia, and then you've got the fact that uh, Norwich is an extremely important site uh, within medieval England um, generally, and not least because of international contacts um, that it has um, at the time. 
um, I could imagine that um, somehow telling the story of medieval knowledge, Norwich, and I speak of this in terms of experience from other such museum centres, um, you know, could could be the thing that that is actually the hardest to do uh, within all of those. Um, how are, how are you going to address that? You, you're absolutely right. It, it is um, uh, a challenge, let's say, because um, if you're hoping to represent um, the whole of East Anglia uh, through something like a British Museum partnership gallery, how do you draw attention to those particular Norwich focused things? It is of course, the county museum, not simply the Norwich Museum anymore. And this is one of the things that we're in particular hoping to draw out in the AVs that we're doing, in particular that very large immersive projection in the Great Hall that will have three projectors overlapping. So you have uh, it actually projecting onto three wall surfaces as well as sound, where one will focus, one show will actually focus on the castle itself as a physical building and what it represents and what it be used for. And the second will emphasize its place within the city of Norwich and uh, the history of the city of Norwich and how it turned from an internationally focused town into an internationally focused city. And within the British Museum Gallery itself, it's going to have to be a far more um, county based uh, experience, I guess. The, the objects will often be international and through the medium of talking about those who fight, those who work, those who pray, obviously there will be a lot of uh, Norwich objects which will be able to highlight certain elements. But I guess one of the, the obvious problems that any museum curator has is that the number of stories outstrips by some measure the amount of text that you can actually put into a display space. And you try and get away with things by putting it into uh, extra interactives or little videos and all sorts of other things. Um, it's always exceptionally frustrating to know that you have 150 words to write about a whole subject when you want to be able to uh, regurgitate the book that you just read about it. So it, it is something that we've, um, thought about and it's something that we're working through at the moment because we do have ideas about how we are we're going to meet that challenge great well i've got um i've got four more uh, questions in in here now which i think is going to be as much as we can um ask you to answer and if the um people who have put them through to me will um forgive me um about this um i will take them in what i think is an order that fits best in um, thematically with uh, what you've just um, been saying, because um, in fact, there's a question that has come in fairly recently, which has talked about you, you touched on the question of the, the blood libel. Um, mm -hmm. And it's simply a, a request for you to expand upon that a bit, please. Uh, the, well, it, this, this goes back to the idea of um, the, the the Jews, medieval Jews in, in England, making sacrifices of, of Christian children. And of course, it, it's a fantasy, but it's one of those awkward pieces of the Jewish medieval past, the Jewish medieval story, that my own uh, opinion is that we shouldn't shy away from. We've often, uh, in, in the world of museums, talked about museums being safe spaces to talk about difficult subjects. And I think that this is a particularly in the, the, the sort of woke era, Black Lives Matters, a really important thing to be able to try and articulate, albeit in, in the very limited way that we can in the amount of space uh, and sort of words that we have, that um, there was in, incredible, um, uh, there were incredible issues with the medieval Jewish population. Um, there, there was an inc incredible hardship on the 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 part of the medieval Jews. And this is actually exacerbated uh, by the, the fact that we have a, a more knowledge now from a series of 12 bodies found in a well excavated on the Chapelfield site that several of them may well have been Jewish. There was a very, uh, I have to say, poor BBC documentary looking at this in which they were extrapolating from very limited DNA evidence about uh, whether some people were Jewish. There is no such thing as Jewish DNA, but further studies suggest that the, the people uh, were of a certain extraction which has a predominant uh, Jewish population. So 
it now looks like we actually have physical evidence for the sort of pogroms that might have been uh, conducted. In, in medieval Norwich. And so this is something, one of those difficult stories that we want to be able to, to tell, but I think it's equally incumbent upon us, particularly me as a curator who isn't Jewish, to be able to allow the current Jewish population to be able to make those sorts of conversations themselves, to draw attention to it, but also to be able to navigate the difficulty of those stories in, in a contemporary way. Thanks very much indeed. I'm actually going to uh, join two questions to, uh, together um, here. A um, question from Karadak Peters is, um, who was the chapel dedicated to? And if it's not known, would St Edmund have been a suitable choice for East Anglia? Um, and I'll link that with a question from uh, Jenny Freeman, which is linked really only in terms of period. Um, but how, how did Norwich emerged as a boom town in the late Saxon period, and what was the reason um, for that? Uh, well, to take the first one, we don't actually know uh, who the chapel was dedicated to, but interestingly, in that little temporary reconstruction of the chapel wall that um, I showed you, we actually have scenes from the life of St Edmund uh, as a wall painting on it, so it's something that we were very keen to portray as an East Anglian saint ourselves. Um, what we are hoping, actually, is that we actually have a license for marriage in the, the castle. The registry office moved itself into the castle. And one day, I think it would be rather nice if uh, we were able to conduct wedding ceremonies in the new chapel space. Uh, that, that, that's all for the future. Uh, as far as we know, the chapel was never deconsecrated. Um, in terms of how Norwich became a, a boom town in the late Anglo-Saxon period, this is something that has come increasingly to, to the fore with archaeological excavations in the last 20 years. And it was very clear that Thetford had been the major East Anglian town that took over from Ipswich uh, in about the, the 9th, 10th century. And in, in the 11th century, we see an eclipsing of Thetford as Norwich takes over. And it's almost certainly due to riverine transport that the, the route to Norwich is that much more easy, it's that much more accessible, and therefore Norwich takes off uh, as the easier place to get to. Uh, and presumably because in turn, it has a uh, very good access to its wider hinterland. And this is all, always, I think, one of the interesting things when you think about uh, maps of Norwich. If you look at Norwich on a map, it's like the, uh, the, the hub of a wheel, all of the roads in Norfolk lead directly to Norwich. And it really reflects the fact that uh, Norwich is not just a city on its own, but it is uh, very much a, a county town. It is the centre uh, economically of the entire county. Um, yes, I'll, I'll pass on um, with that what's effectively a comment, which is that um, uh, it's important to emphasise the maritime correct connections um, with the uh, continent um, to not just to take a local and Anglo-centric um, view um, of it. Um, the last question I'm going to put to you, Tim, is one from um, Andrew Selkirk, um, which is again a very, very practical one, but have you had any financial input from local businessmen? Yes, we have. Uh, I, I can't uh, name them and credit them all, but we've had a very a successful fundraising and that has had uh, a number of local businesses as well as local charities that have been putting money in towards the overall redevelopment. But I think one of the, the nicest aspects has been a successful adopt an object scheme. So rather than adopting an elephant, you can adopt uh, a medieval sword. And uh, interestingly enough, our um, various daggers, in particular, the Bollock dagger has been very popular with sponsors. I can't imagine why, but it's it's been a very nice real way of getting people uh, involved with feeling that it's, it's their collection. And we've had a number of businesses that have acted actually um, been, been keen on sponsoring that. So our, our very first uh, sponsorship was, was actually by an optometrist who uh, was sponsoring some, some objects that he found particularly uh, interesting and sort of related to his own line of work. Right, 
Thank you very much in detail. I don't know whether we're going to have to bleep that rude word for the YouTube version of um, <laughs> talk in, 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 in the future, but it'll be a properly adult. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Thank you. Well, that, that, that's how these these um, these knives are actually known. So it, it's, uh, it's yes, a technical no, I, I, uh, Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm trying to pretend I don't know, but I do. Um, let me thank you on behalf of the society and indeed everybody who will have um, uh, listened in and enjoyed this. And I see, you know, the people I can see here that uh, applause is being, being, being offered in the form of hands being um, put together. So thank you very much indeed for that, uh, Tim. Um, Pleasure. I give, yeah, I give notice that the uh, next meeting will be on Thursday, the 26th of November, 2020, when we will hear a paper Pandemic on Hadrian's Wall, evidence in the collection of the Society of Antiquaries of Newcastle upon Tyne, which will be given by Dr. Nick Hodgson, FSA. The meeting stands adjourned.